you know, group them together. True. Yeah. True. Superimpose them wherever That's they right. are. You can do that. Looks like Tony and Francis were missing and Teresa.
I think we got everybody now. Excellent. So we ready to begin? I'm going to pinch hit for Deb. Um, even though I, she's on the call, I think her, uh, she might have a cough or something like that, that it's it, kind of it's about every two minutes guys. And it would be a very disruptive meeting if I tried. Right on cue. Okay. So the board member photo is not going to happen today. I think we all understand that. Roll call, uh, call the meeting to order, 631, salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, are there any agenda changes? No? Okay. Then the uh, next item is privilege of the floor. And uh, I don't see anyone from the public on the call. So uh, I'm going to take that as uh, no one from the public is uh, going to express tonight. Moving on to administrative reports, we have Katie Wilson doing a presentation on athletics. So I decided to do the Zoom call in or the Google Meet in my office, and there happens to be a basketball game on the other side of the wall. So I apologize if you can't hear me. Um, but I'm just going to give you a quick recap of what we have for winter athletics right now. Um, we have a total of 104 athletes. Uh, the majority of those athletes come from basketball. Um, our strongest program would probably be boys basketball at this point. Um, and we have a solid amount of bowling uh, bowling members uh, with three girls on that team, um, wrestlers and cheerleaders that went from a solid two to an entire squad of 10. So um, that's a pretty good turnout for cheerleaders. So we got a pretty good turnout for winter uh, athletics this year. Um, to give you a quick update on our teams in general, uh, our girls varsity basketball team, if you haven't heard yet, is ranked number one in the state for Class C, which is pretty impressive for them. Um, they've competed both within the WAC and in uh, higher level, level schools. Um, so they're six and two right now. They had two tough losses to an A and a double A school. I know over the break, they lost by one to Albany, um, which was a little bit of a heartbreaker, but um, a really good experience for them to take on those bigger schools. Uh, bowling is two and seven, but they did have an awesome victory last night over uh, NDBG, which is great. Um, so they're trucking along. Uh, boys varsity basketball, who is playing right now, um, they're four and three right now and two and two in the league. Um, and a lot of that the coach mentioned was due to quarantines and things along those lines. But now they got a full squad right now. So they're hoping to start turning on the Jets and wrestling. They are 12 and five right now. Uh, good old Dwaynesburg wrestling holding strong. Um, they came first place in the Schenectady County duels uh, and second place in the Doc Davis duels. Um, on top of that, we have two sophomores that were offered um, or given college offers for basketball and one varsity basketball player that accepted a college offer to Skidmore. Um, so on the athletic end, uh, we're doing pretty well. Cool. How much longer is uh, the winter season? So it'll end around February, depending on, so the state tournaments um, range anywhere from wrestling. It is the end of February, middle to end of February. Um, basketball uh, sectionals will happen in February and then states would go more into March. So mm -hmm. anywhere around like that late March or late February um, is the overall when everyone should be done unless they go further on. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, my wife just mentioned to me she can't get into the public stream that 
the stream is not available to her organization. She, just as a heads up. Okay, I'm not sure if there's anything we can do about that at this point. <clears throat> um, moving on to the superintendent. Jim, Jim you were oh. muted if you were talking. Yeah, I was just, I was just saying that we um, we will put up the recording tomorrow for anybody who can't get in. Um, let me see if I can do one thing. If you can just give me one second, I can see if I I can make a little bitty change. Sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure why that is. So fortunately, I don't think I can do anything about it now, but I can look into it after. And if if there are folks, I mean, she can uh, join via the link that I sent out today to participate. Yeah, she was able to get on using my daughter's account, just not the general public. So I think the next item is uh, your report, Jim. Jim, you're muted. I'll just continue to do that. So uh, just so that um, everybody's aware of some of the things that um, I sent out yesterday. Um, there have been some changes to COVID protocols. Um, one of the biggest things is that we're now able to do um, tests to stay, which is something that we had been hoping to do for a while um, and had been piloted in other counties. Um, so test to stay is uh, basically a program in which um, instead of being quarantined, um, students can stay in school and just participate in some rapid testing three times during the course of what would be a normal quarantine. So over the course of seven days, um, students would have to test three times at regular intervals. There's a chart that explains exactly when people have to um, do that, have to do some testing. Um, so it's an optional alternative for people who've been placed on quarantine. It's nothing that anyone needs to do. It's just something that folks may do. Um, and we're going to start it with uh, uh, preschool uh, until grade two. Um, the reason why we're starting it with those grades is because those have been the grades that are the hardest hit. Um, we're more likely to send a whole class home in uh, PK kindergarten, first or second grade, just because those kids tend to be in closer proximity with each other. And um, so I think that this will be a good option for folks who want to participate in it. But like I said, it's totally up to people if they want to participate. Um, if they do, we'll give them the tests. We'll give them the sheet that they um, you know, need to fill out. Uh, they can do the tests at home, or they can have our nurses do them in school. Um, some things to think about for people who are participating in that is that there are three tests within that quarantine window. And if people are doing it at home, they do have to fill out an attestation that they've done those three tests and that they've all been negative. Um, they, uh, for some reason, it's only open to people who have test or who have been exposed and quarantined because of something that happened at school. Um, for instance, like if something, if they had close contact on a bus or close contact in a classroom, 
Um, I'm not going to try to explain why that is. Um, I'm just saying that that's the way it is for now. And um, so we will uh, do that. Uh, students must be asymptomatic to participate in this. They certainly can't be showing any symptoms of COVID. Um, and the school does need to have permission from a parent to be able to test students in school. Um, if the parents want to test them at home, that's fine. We can give them at-home test kits to use. Um, and they can test them at home. We just need that signed attestation. Um, as always, we will not be tracking anybody down to um, you know, test them without them having provided consent to us uh, beforehand. It's not something that we would do. The program is subject to the availability of tests. Um, I'm sorry, did somebody have a hand? Was that a hand raised? It's, it's me. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just got a notice that a bunch of people are trying to get into the same as, same as um, Francis, but I don't know what to tell them. Uh, so I would say to them to go to the link, the participation link okay. that I sent out earlier today and see if they can't use that to get in. If not, they can check the recording tomorrow. Okay. I did go on a, my other laptop and I'm on the participation link. So I, I didn't have any problems. Yeah, for some reason, it seems like some people are having trouble if they're not trying to log in with a school um, email address. And so those folks, I don't, I don't know why that is. This, this program changes a little bit every time we try to use it. So I apologize for that, but you can use the other link and get on. Um, the, uh, so the availability of the tests is an important thing. Um, if we run out of tests, we obviously can't do test to stay any longer. Um, so hopefully we'll continue to get tests. We just got a thousand um, at-home test kits. I think that's going to be the biggest chunk that we get. And from here on out, we're going to get smaller orders to replenish our stock. Um, also, it's important for people to know that this only allows people to attend school. It doesn't allow people to attend extracurricular events or participate in athletics. It's just for school. Um, we also have uh, signed on to a test to return early program. So um, we had started doing this before the break with PCR tests. So if somebody takes a PCR test on day five and, take, and that test comes in negative, they can return on day eight, um, so after the seventh day. Um, however, we've added to that now. Now we can use uh, rapid tests, two negative rapid tests, taken 36 hours apart on day five and six um, in place of that PCR. We do have lots of these at-home COVID tests, so people know um, this isn't something that the district spent money on. Um, really, I don't know that we would have been able to obtain this many tests if we had wanted to spend money on it. Um, they're really hard to come by if anybody's been trying to look for these at drug stores recently. So the state has provided us with these um, at-home test kits um, really to be distribution agents for the public to try to get these out to families who are in need of test tests. So. Um, folks are welcome to use these things to test their kids if they're asymptomatic um, or if they're showing symptoms whatever they want to use them for um, we they are uh, upon request so you do have to request that from a nurse to be able to get a test kit we're not just going to put them in people's backpacks and send them home which i believe the governor did suggest that schools would be doing um, we think that it would probably be a bad idea if we put a bunch of uh, test kits on buses with uh, all kinds of students, because I don't know <laughs> that how many of them would get home. Um, and also, uh, it's important for folks to know that um, these kits do have two tests in them, but a lot of the protocols that we have now require you to take two tests 36 hours apart for these rapid tests to be used in place of a PCR test. And again, um, subject to, to availability. Uh, we're told that we're going to keep getting these things, not sure. 
I know that the ones that um, came, they came with all different kinds of labels on them to different schools with all different kinds of expiration dates. Um, I'll also say that some of our expiration dates are the beginning of February. Um, however, they've extended the expiration date 90 days from that. So if anybody gets one and they're like, well, this thing's expired, it's kind of like uh, the salad dressing in your refrigerator. You got, you got a little while <laughs> before they're actually bad. Not the salad dressing in my mother-in-law's refrigerator, which is ancient, but the salad dressing in a normal person's refrigerator. Um, does anyone have any questions about the COVID uh, protocols before we go on? Jim, I, I have a quick question. It, on the, you said that if they had, if they were symptomatic and they had, took two in the thirty-six hours, are they then considered? This is really a personal question, but are yeah. they then considered like safe to be around other people? Because obviously, I have a guest with me, and that's because her mom has COVID. So. Yep. So yes. Yeah, so taking two right now, people are considering two rapid tests taken thirty-six hours apart. To be the same as a PCR test. So as soon as they test negative twice, um, they're good to go. Any other questions? Um, we are still staying open. Everything's good as long as we have staff to keep people there, right? That's yeah, we're going to stay currently. open. Okay. So there's there's really nothing right now that I could foresee that would cause us to uh, close entirely. Um, I, I even don't think that there's a situation where um, we would have to close because of um, staffing right now. I think that we would probably just reorganize staff that we have in order to continue to have school for folks. Um, so that's not something that's, and it's not something that's being advised by anybody. Um, there's really no organization right now that's advising schools to close preemptively. Um, so. I mean, things always happen, orders change, but yeah, no plans to do that now. We did uh, a couple of other things that we've done um, as mitigation strategies. Uh, one, we have extended uh, the pause on youth wrestling, and I've asked youth, youth basketball to do the same um, for another couple of weeks to see if things calm down a little bit. Um, we have a, a large number of positive cases um, and so it doesn't seem like it would be a very good idea to um, reopen those things now with students who are kind of the least vaccinated population of kids that we have right now. Um, but most of our staff are, uh, are vaccinated um, and so wouldn't be subject to quarantine. However, we know now that, you know, what could happen now is that, I mean, they could get sick, they could um, get the virus and, you know, then we have a staffing shortage, but fingers crossed that doesn't occur. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I did wanna talk more about um, equity and as because of last, last meeting, and also before I move on, if anybody has any questions about COVID, about any of these protocols and is watching the video later, please feel free to shoot me an email if you need clarification or ask a nurse. I'm happy to do that for you. So moving on to um, some of the equity concerns or equity program concerns that folks had at the meeting last time. So I want everybody to know that I really did um, listen to what everybody was saying and the concerns that folks have. Um, one thing that that happened a couple of times was um, I did hear people say that um, they weren't aware of an, an issue and so they didn't quite know where this program was coming from at Dwaynesburg. So um, as I said last week, so this is a regional initiative, it's also a state initiative, um, but there are reasons at Dwaynesburg to uh, focus on equity at this time. I did want to go through a couple of things there was also a, a great suggestion that a community member sent to us um, about uh, defining some terms for people in the policy that the board's considering. So I wanted to go through that too. And then I wanted to give some examples of some different issues that happen here. Um, so when we're talking about educational equity, 
we're really just trying to make sure that everybody has access to the resources and rigor they need. So not the same for everybody, because some people need different kinds of rigor. Um, we know that some kids need more rigor than other students. Um, we know that everybody is worthy of being challenged. And so that's important to us. And then everybody needs access to the resources that they need to be successful. One of the concerns that folks had um, that I heard a couple of times was, well, does this mean that you're giving everybody, um, they, I think the term was a trophy, that you're giving everybody a, kind of a participation award. Um, and that's not really what we're talking about at all. So it's important for people to know that at the end of the day, students, all of our students still have to complete the same requirements to graduate. They still have to take the same tests. They still have to, um, to do the same work in classes. There just may be uh, different ways to approach it. So I wanted to share some of the thought process behind what's going on in our head as educators when we're talking about uh, educational equity. So one thing that we're looking at is um, the issues that we've uncovered through data analysis. So I'm not sure that folks know uh, how much data analysis the average teacher does these days, but it's a lot. <laughs> and so um, we used to have a data committee that's the, where the job was just to focus on data. We don't have that so much anymore because every committee we have in the district um, uses data as its core. Um, it, at this point, it would kind of be like having a, a pencil committee. It's so ubiquitous that it seems funny to just put it off by itself. It's part of everything we do. Um, we also do lots of observations and have analysis in other ways. We give lots of surveys out to kids. So it's important for folks to know that um, these aren't issues that uh, we're making up. These are issues that actually come through data. And so tonight, I'm going to share some specific data um, with you so that you know what we're basing this on. We're also thinking about, first, so what improvements can we make to our programs that would benefit everybody? That's where we always start. So those of you who are familiar with response to intervention, that like pyramid, those different tiers, um, the first tier, the base of the pyramid is always like, well, what can we do to, to, to solve problems for everybody? Um, so does that mean that we need new math programs for everybody? Do we need a new science program? Do we need more training for all teachers? Um, so that's always where we start is to say, well, what would benefit all students? Certainly nothing that would benefit a student is going to be withheld from a student um, unless it interferes with the rigor that they need to be successful. The um, another thing that we think about is when my computer unfreezes. I'm, I'm spinning now, but as as my computer finishes, um, I do want people to know that um, what this has to do with is getting rid of the obstacles um, that some students have that don't have anything to do with the learning. So we're not taking away obstacles. Um, it, by obstacles, I don't mean things like rigor or challenge. Obstacles are things that you can reduce or remove that don't impact the learning at all. Um, so we're always thinking about what resources we can add without diluting the content. So it's really important that everything remains rigorous and challenging for everybody. We don't want to dilute the content, but there are some things that we can just take away. The other thing that I, I really hope that people understand um, is that there's no scenario where a student who has obstacles to success has to work less hard because of the work that we're doing to try to make things more equitable. So I was telling somebody this morning that this little diagram that's become really famous, the one on the left is um, supposed to represent equality. So it's giving everybody the same things. And the one on the right is supposed to represent equity. So supposed to represent giving um, everybody what they need to be successful. But I was saying today that it's pretty inaccurate 
because the kid with the two boxes is still going to have to jump up and down <laughs> to try to see as much of the game as possible. So what we find in these situations and the situations that we're going to be talking about is that even though we're trying to remove obstacles, it's still a lot more work for the folks that we're talking about than other than it might be for other people. So we're going to talk a little bit about what seeking equity would mean at, at Dwaynesburg. Um, so one of the questions is, there was a lot of conversation about race um, and race and Christmas, I think, dominated the conversation last time. Those are two things that are, are very, um, uh, not things that we really discussed um, as being important elements of our program. Certainly racial equity is important, but we have a fairly homogenous um, racial makeup in our student body right now. And so the, the real impetus for this program were to two demographic areas um, that we do see issues with in terms of equity. And the first one is um, with students with disabilities. So um, we see all over the board um, data that suggests that we're not providing um, enough resources or the right resources to make sure that all of our special education students are successful. Um, and that's not to say that our special education teachers aren't doing a great job, they are. Um, and our special ed program works really, really hard to try to make sure that kids um, still stay on par with their peers. But there are lots of obstacles for special ed students that prevent them from doing less well than their peers. Um, even if the disability that they have isn't necessarily related to you know, one of the content areas. So for example, um, this is a chart that shows three through eighth grade math state assessments over time. And so the purple represents general ed students and their proficiency levels on three through eighth grade exams. And the gold represents uh, students with disability and their proficiency levels. And so you can see on math that there is a stark difference between gen ed students and special ed students. Now, it, it makes logical sense that special ed students would uh, tend to struggle more on these areas, but that is a significant gap. And when we have, um, and we are right now providing certain supports to special education students that are supposed to minimize this gap. And so, but what, we, what we're seeing is that uh, the way that we're approaching it isn't, um, isn't achieving what we want to achieve yet. So if you look at ELA, it's the same story. So even though our proficiency rates have gone up consistently um, and our, our special ed proficiency rates are just lagging behind by so, by so much. The same is true on Regents exams. So if you look at proficiency rates of all Regents exams, um, special ed students, um, you know, achieve proficiency at a much lower rate. Some special ed students are able to take advantage of safety nets, which allow them to score below proficiency. However, we know that a lot of our special education students are attending college after they leave high school. And um, because of that, they're probably putting themselves in situations where they have to pay for remedial courses in college. And so we want to try to um, reduce that to the extent possible. We definitely think that there's something that more that can be done to try to lessen this gap. Um, another issue that we see is not just with the achievement of special ed students, but even with how we're challenging special ed students. So there's a question about whether or not um, special ed students are uh, are they choosing not to take um, upper level math and science courses or are they not being given the right encouragement to take those courses? Whatever the reason, what it's resulting in is kids, the, the majority of which of whom will go to college, 
um, probably ending up in a remedial class once they get to college. And that's that's not a bad thing for some people. Some people need that extra year of math before they start their college coursework, but we want to reduce that to the extent that we can. Um, and also, we do provide lots of supports in uh, math and science um, that would support these special ed students if they were to choose to go on. But there, there are a lot of doors that they're closing, and we want to see if we can't make some of those doors stay open longer for these kids by encouraging them to continue taking math and science instead of just um, doing the, the courses that they need to do to uh, earn their credits. Uh, the second group that I wanted to bring to your attention was our economically disadvantaged students. So in many cases, this group is the same, um, a lot of overlap between economically disadvantaged students and special ed students. Um, however, there's nothing that says that just because a student's family makes less money than another student's family that they should do less well on exams um, or in classes. But what we find is that that's actually what's happening. It's like to a lesser extent than special ed students. But if you look at our math proficiency, you'll see our economically disadvantaged students are uh, outpaced by the gen ed peers uh, by quite a bit, by a significant margin. The same is true in ELA. And the same is true um, in Regents exams, though the gap uh, closes a little bit on Regents exams. This is science. And the one, the one outlier is in the 2019, um, I'm using 2019 for regents because it's the last um, real regents administration that we had. But in 2019, economically disadvantaged students actually scored uh, better, uh, actually had proficiency at a higher rate than um, non-disadvantaged peers. There are other things that you can look at too that are also pretty stark. Um, I was also looking at average scores on exams. And in both categories, special ed students and economically disadvantaged students, you can see a really big gap between average scores in those two groups. Like I said before, this is not news to you. Um, you probably could assume that something like this might exist, but the gap is pretty stark and it warrants looking at what we can do to try to uh, change the way that we're um, modifying things for these students. Another thing that's pretty interesting, too, is that um, if you look at even quarter grades, even classroom, classroom grades, uh, economically disadvantaged students tend to do less well than their non-disadvantaged peers. Um, so that is, this is a chart that's kind of confusing, but what it shows is on the left-hand side, less left-hand side, it shows economically disadvantaged students 66% of grades scored by them during quarter one, um, those are marking period grades, were in the 90 to 100 range compared to 75% of the non-disadvantaged peers. So something's going on um, with this group. And so we've, we've tried to address this in a lot of different ways. And we're, we're sort of in the exploration phase of just what we should be doing to um, approach this in a different way. So one of the things that we're doing with economically disadvantaged students in elementary school is um, we have a group that just focuses on um, those students to make sure that they're given the supports and they're kind of thinking about school through their mindset to provide those students things that their peers might have um, access to that they just don't. Um, again, you'll see oh this should be this is actually uh the economically disadvantaged students and how uh what they're doing for upper level math and science so this shows like the number of economically disadvantaged students that we have in 11th to 12th grade and it shows uh how many of those uh junior and senior level math and science courses they're taking so um you know a better rate than students with disabilities but still um, not anything close to um, their peers, their gen ed, or their non-disadvantaged peers. The third uh, category that I wanted to talk about, so we talked about uh, students with disabilities, we talked about economically disadvantaged students. Um, I also wanted to point out that 
there's a lot of other ways that we measure how we're doing uh, programmatically. And one of the ways that we do that is through surveying students. So there's a survey that we've used a couple of times now um, just to kind of assess the entire student body. Um, and I've pr provided the board like the, the big number at the top of how the district is doing in a lot of the categories from that survey. And so if you look at the district numbers, we're doing pretty well, like across the board in all categories. But when you start to really look at certain questions and you break them down by demographic groups or even by gender, you start to see a different story emerge. Um, so I wanted to share some of those things with you. So this is just a handful of questions that I found from the, the, the surveys that we handed out. And all of these uh, have to do with uh, high school kids. So I looked at just the junior, senior high school, uh, not the elementary school kid. Elementary school kids, when they fill out surveys, tend to be like overwhelmingly positive about uh, lots of things. Um, but high school kids tend to be a little bit more, a little bit less sunnier <laughs> in terms of their responses. And um, so I did want to share those with you. So one thing I thought was really interesting, we don't think about a lot, I guess I don't think about a lot in terms of diversity is just the gender diversity that we have in our student body. So um, it's, it's really interesting to me that uh, when you look at this statement, boys and girls are treated equally well, that as a school, the high school, 35% uh, of high school students didn't agree with that statement. That seems like a high number to me. Um, I think it's like 275 survey um, surveys were given. And then when you break that down further and look at the difference between boys and girls and uh, how those two groups uh, feel about um, being treated well, that's that's a pretty big difference. And so um, that is something that we're, we mean when we're talking about equity too. Um, another thing was uh, wealth, family wealth, and whether or not kids think that all students are treated the same regardless of whether their parents are rich or poor. And so 27% of the student body in the high school doesn't think that, uh, doesn't think that kids are treated the same. Um, when they come from a rich family or a poor family. I also thought this statement, I feel like I belong, when broken down by uh, gender lines, you could see that there's also a pretty big difference between um, high school boys and high school girls. Um, and also, I think 26% is a fairly high number for um, students who feel like they don't belong in the school. Uh, I thought that this one was also very uh, significant. Um, students at this school are teased or picked on about physical or mental disabilities. So 33% um, of people said that students are picked on because of physical and mental disabilities. And when we asked the question about sexual orientation, 39% um, of high school students said that students in the school were picked on because of real or perceived uh, sexual orientations. So um, you can also break this survey down by racial lines. And um, so we had uh, 28 non-white students complete the survey and 255 white students complete the survey in the high school. And so um, when you look at questions like people of different cultural backgrounds, races or ethnicities get along well in the school, um, you see a difference between um, you have some non-white students saying that, 21% of non-white students saying that um, students don't get along well. So I think that's significant too. And um, also a, a rather significant portion of uh, students, I thought, especially Hispanic students, um, of whom there are 24 in the high school, um, the high school, middle school, that said that students were teased or picked on about race and ethnicity. Oh, sorry, um, yeah, so 30% thought that they were. Um, I also teased out this, I feel like I belong question um, along racial lines. And you can see that along racial lines, there are some students who are non-white students 
um, non-Hispanics or and Hispanic students who feel like they don't belong in the school. So um, these are these are just some data points that I pulled out to address that question about whether or not these are issues that we're having at Dwaynesburg. I want people to know that um, when we go about doing any kind of program, we start from a place where we're looking at data. Um, we're not doing it by feel or gut. Um, we're doing it based on what numbers tell us and what students are telling us. Um, and so I hope that that's helpful in kind of presenting a different picture of um, what we mean when we're talking about equity, um, because I think it's much different than a lot of folks' perception of what it is that we're doing here. Um, so that's all I have. I wonder, does anybody have any questions for me about any of this stuff? I just want to say, Jim, thank you for taking the time to sort of tease that out for us. I think it's really valuable information. Um, and, and, you know, I'm a data person as well. And so to be able to see that and understand, you know, what's driving us, we know that anyway, but to be able to see it in the numbers is really helpful. So thank you for taking the time to do that. I would say too, so this is not just all, any of these statistics, right? You could expect to find similar statistics at many other um, schools. So this isn't just a problem that we're dealing with. And so um, that's why we've taken a regional approach to this, because we know that it's widespread. Um, so I, I just hope people understand that too. Well, and I just want to acknowledge that a widespread problem doesn't mean we don't address it just because everybody has it. I think it's even more so important for us to consider how we can change those numbers for the positive. And I, I, I'd like to say that um, I think it's even when you separate out the numbers, if you just go from your personal experience, you're aware of that person that always seemed like they never really belonged, that they never really had a fair shot. And um, it's nice now that the school is finally in writing saying that everybody gets a shot. It's not just a story anymore. It is actually a policy. It's going to be a rule that the school has to provide everybody the same same shot. And I think that's awesome. Anybody else? I guess we'll we'll move on then. Um, presentation and approval of prior Board of Education meeting minutes. Approve the minutes of the December 14th, 2021 board meeting. Uh, recommendation that the Board of Education accept the meeting minutes from the December 14th, 2021 meeting as submitted. Do I have a motion? A motion. Um, I'm not sure who that was. That was Teresa. Teresa, good. And, and Diane. Someone Teresa and Diane, so first and <laughs> second there. Um, any questions or comments? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, uh, moving on to Board of Education Standing Committees. Uh, audit committee, we didn't meet. Um, did any of the other committees meet? How about Building and Grounds? No, our meeting was canceled. Yeah. Education? Uh, we are going to meet on the 18th um, at 5.30 before our board meeting. Okay. Um, policy? We have not met since the last meeting. And uh, lastly, public relations? Nope. Okay. Moving on to financial items. Accept claims auditor reports. Recommendation that the Board of Education accept the claims auditor's comments on General Warren A20 uh, for 121,320 and 38 
cents and capital warrant HP2 for $2,125, dated December 16th, 2021. Uh, do I have a motion? I'll motion. Okay, Melissa, thank you. Second, Francis. Second. All right, questions or comments? No. All right, um, all in favor then, say aye. aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, next item, accept financial reports. Recommendation that the Board of Education accept the appro appropriation status, budget transfer, revenue status, and treasurer's reports ending November 30, 2021 as provided by the treasurer and recommended by the assistant superintendent of management services. Uh, do I have a motion? A motion. Okay, thank you, Diane. Second? I'll second. Okay, Tony, thank you. Any questions or comments? None. Um, okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Last financial item. Approve agreement between the district and Shalmont. Recommendation that the Dwaynesburg Board of Education approve the agreement between Shalmont Central School District and Dwaynesburg Central School District for September 9, 2021 through June 30, 2022, as recommended by the Assistant Superintendent of Management Services. This agreement shall not be binding on the parties until authorized and signed by each party's respective representatives. Do I have a motion? A motion. Teresa, second? I'll second. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, any questions or comments? None. Okay. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Moving on to other approved CSE minutes. Recommendation of the Board of Education accept the recommendation of the CSE meetings and their minutes from the December 13th, 14th, 15th and 16th, 2021 meetings as submitted. Do I have a motion? A motion. a motion. Okay, Francis and then Tony, will you second? Yes. Thank you. Questions or comments? None. Okay. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Next item, approve unpaid administrative internship. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby accepts the recommendation of the superintendent to appoint Katherine Wilson to the position of unpaid administrative intern for the spring 2022 semester until the end of the fall 2022 semester. Ms. Wilson will continue to fulfill her duties as a physical education teacher and athletic director during the duration of the internship and will, therefore, continue to accrue service time as a 1.0 full-time equivalent teacher in her tenure area. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Diane, thank you. Second? I'll second. Thank you, Teresa. Okay, questions or comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, moving on to a policy item, approve policy. Recommendation that the Board of Education approve policy 3430, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the district as recommended by the superintendent. Do I have a motion? 
Shane, I'd like to make a motion to uh, delay the vote on this policy until we can collect additional information over the course of the next week. Okay. So okay. we can put it on the agenda for, I think, the 18th is the date of the next one. Okay. Uh, does anyone want to second that motion? I'll second it. Sounds good. Any questions or comments? I would just say that that's a, an exceptionally good idea, especially considering um, some folks were having a difficult time getting on the stream. Um, so maybe that would give them the time to do that. And also, um, it's probably a, a good idea as well because of the additional definitions that were added to the beginning of the policy. So people will have time to review that. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hey, Shane. Yes. Um, I, do you mind? I, I know that somebody was um, sent me another message saying that they ha were having a difficult time to getting in. I wonder if we can go out of order a little bit and see if any of the folks who have logged in um, did wish to make any kind of public comment that they were prevented from making before. Okay, we can. We can do that. If, so returning, so I guess we would return back to the yeah. privilege of the floor. And, uh, you know, we apologize if people had trouble signing in, but is there anyone from the public at this time that would like to uh, make any comments? Thanks. I, I'd like to make a comment. Okay. Uh, can you tell me who's speaking, please? Yes, William Wenzel. Uh huh. I would like to thank the board for their efforts and for postponing public comment. That's much appreciated. And uh, I ask, please, that if you will be able to have the next meeting, if it is not open to the public, that uh, the IT, I'm sure you want to resolve the IT issues so that folks who want to gain access will be able to. And I just ask that, uh, please, as board members, I I'm sure you're well aware of public sentiment within the community, and uh, uh, just ask that you be sensitive to uh, a, a lot of thoughts in the community that are, are well intended, but ha certainly have questions with regard to um, this policy and and have concerns and i just ask you to be attentive to that and take take time to uh consider the thoughts and the feelings of a lot of the folks within the district thank you thank you is there anyone else who would like to say something Okay, I'll take that as uh, no one else is um, interested in speaking at this time. So we'll move back to where we were in the agenda. And again, let me apologize to those people that had difficulty connecting um, earlier. So now we're on to personnel items. Approve appointments. Recommendation that the Board of Education approve the following substitute appointments as recommended by the superintendent. All appointments are employees at will, and the appointment at this time does not guarantee employment for the entire school term or year. And that is the BOCES substitute list. Do I have a motion? I'll motion. Thank you, Melissa. Second? I'll second. Thanks, Diane. Questions or comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
Okay. Next item, accept resignation for retirement. M. Neitzel. Recommendation that the Board of Education accept the resignation for retirement of Mary Neitzel, special education, uh, effective June 30, 2022. Do I have a motion? A motion. Thank you, Teresa. A second? A second. Thanks, Diane. Uh, questions or comments? I would just like to thank Mary for her um, exceptional service to the district. She's worked for the district for over 30 years and has really served us very well and she'll be very, very much missed. Jim, I'm just going to echo that having personal experience uh, working with Mary for uh, a child with disabilities. It was nice to have her in, in our court as we navigated the system. She was helpful on many occasions. All right. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Next item. Accept resignation for retirement. K. Kanarkowitz. Recommendation that the Board of Education accept the resignation for retirement of Karen Kanarkowitz. Uh, 7 through 12 social studies teacher effective june 30 2022 do i have a motion a motion thank you melissa second i'll second thanks francis uh, any questions or comments again i would just say so she hasn't been with us as long as mary um however karen um started her career elsewhere and then came here and spent the bulk of it with us and we just really thank her for all the work that she's done on behalf of our kids. Yeah, I'll, I'll say my my two uh, children um, had her as a teacher and enjoyed her very much. All right, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, last personnel item. Accept resignation, M. Adalian. Recommendation that the Board of Education accept the resignation of Michelle Adalian, elementary reading teacher, effective January 17, 2022. Do I have a motion? A motion. Thank you, Diane. Second? I'll second. Thank you, Tony. Questions or comments? All right. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the next item is just information. Um, it's not for us to vote on. And it's um, about a counseling intern, James Malia. I just wanted you to have uh, knowledge of this, that we're going to be hosting an intern in a counseling office. May I ask a question or two? Sure. Yeah. Um, sure. Where, uh, where will he be? Is he going to be in the junior, senior high? Uh, junior, senior high, yeah. And um, is he, uh, I mean, obviously he's a student, so he'll have a supervisor from St. Rose, I assume, and then also be working with Kristen? Yep. Awesome. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Any other it's questions? Important. I know I know that a lot of uh, schools at, at, at this time have kind of been shy about hosting uh, interns and student teachers and things like that, but these are folks that we really need. Uh, we really need them to come into the workforce, and so whatever we can do to... Um, try to make things happen for them as well. As a professional who required such training, I am 100% behind it. So thank you. <laughs> is he going to focus on the standard like college guidance counseling, or is it more standard student quasi mental health counseling? Just for what we the call focus? it. We call it school counseling. Okay. Um, 
and, and so yeah, he'll be with the school counselors. Okay. Jim, how long will he be with us for? Is it like a full semester? He's here for the second semester. Yeah. Second semester. Okay. Anything else? Okay, with that, next on the agenda is uh, we're going into executive session. Um, so the board is going to go into executive session, and the plan is that we will not be returning uh, to any regular business afterwards. So uh, I need a motion to move to executive session. I'll motion. Okay. <laughs> Francis and Melissa, is that okay for you second? Sure. All right. Thank you very much. So this concludes our regular board meeting. Thank you. I'll see you on the other link. Yep. So everybody exit out and call up the other link. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night.